John chapter 3. We started um, a series a couple of weeks ago looking at John's gospel, and um, we're going to go through the whole uh, of John's gospel over the next few weeks, and we've probably come to uh, one of the most familiar passages in Scripture, even for, for those who uh, might, might not have a, a great um, biblical knowledge, they're probably aware of uh, the verse that we'll, we'll come to today in John chapter 3. But so far, um, we've seen um, the Lord uh, um, be uh, pronounced as the Lamb of God by John the Baptist. We've seen uh, a few of the disciples following the Lord. We've seen the Lord's first miracle at Canaan. And last week, we saw the cleansing of uh, the temple. And it might have been as a result of this cleansing of the temple that Nicodemus pays uh, the Lord a visit. And it says in uh, John chapter 3 and verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Uh, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou heardest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master in Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not a witness. If I had told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again, Lord, for this time together today. We thank you for the opportunity to be found in this place today, to be able to come around your word. And Father, we just... I pray uh, specifically today now, Lord, for, uh, for Calum's family and just ask that you would undertake there, Lord, in a great way. We pray that you would provide them a, a sense of your uh, uh, presence and peace, Lord, and I just ask that you would give them the strength they need in the weeks that face them ahead. Father, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts today and whatever the need is here today, Lord, I pray that that need would be met. Father, I pray that you would, through your word today, be able to comfort our hearts, be able to challenge us, to be able to equip us, strengthen us, Lord. I pray again, if there's one year this morning that has yet to trust Christ as their Savior, Father, may they come to an understanding of this uh, greatest text that we have uh, before us today, that God so loved the world, uh, that he gave his only begotten Son, uh, that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And Father, we just pray that your will be done among us today, for we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. The first thing we see uh, this morning is the world's greatest tragedy. Um, Nicodemus was a man who, on the outward appearance, had absolutely everything. He was a Pharisee. The word Pharisee literally means a separated one. Uh, they separated themselves from all ordinary walks of life. They kept every detail of the law, not just the 613 laws uh, that, that uh, God had given to Moses, but also the extra laws. Uh, of the, the rabbinical uh, writings and the, that the scribes had written. Um, there were around about 6,000 Pharisees uh, in, uh, in Israel, and they entered a brotherhood called the Shabura, uh, and they would uh, take a pledge to keep these particular rules. And their focus of attention was always on the outward appearance, and that's something the Lord rebuked them about. He said, outwardly, you look perfect. Inwardly, completely different story. Isn't it amazing how we can put on a facade? You know, outward, we, we could look perfect. We can look as if everything is okay. You know, how many times have we said to people, how are you feeling? Yeah, I'm okay. Uh, and you know they're not because you know some of the things that they're struggling with. Wouldn't, 
would it be a breath of fresh air if we actually said the truth sometimes? How are you feeling? Do you know what? Rubbish. Absolutely rubbish. I'm struggling with this, 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 and this. But outward we, you know, we might look okay, but inwardly we've got these turmoils going on and these struggles and these hurts. Uh, outwardly, Nicodemus looked like the perfect religious person, but inwardly there was something drastically lacking. Um, the Pharisees um, did believe in God. They believed that God was the God of the living. They believed in the resurrection and, and that there was life beyond the grave. And Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews. He had, uh, if you like, um, worked his way to an elevated position within uh, the ranks of the Pharisees. Uh, Nicodemus uh, was a member of the Sanhedrin, the, the 70 member Supreme Court of the Jewish people. And they had religious jurisdiction over the Jews. That's why, um, you know, when they came to ask John the Baptist what was going on, they, you know, they had the jurisdiction in terms of religion over the Jewish people. So they came to see what was going on with John the Baptist. That's why they asked the Lord, in whose authority do you perform these miracles? They asked John, in whose authority are you uh, baptizing uh, and preaching this message? So they dealt with anybody they suspected of being a, uh, a false prophet. Uh, Nicodemus was a rich man. And we know that Nicodemus was rich because of what he provided for the Lord's baptism. It says in John 19, 39, there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Uh, this wasn't just, uh, you know, something that was lying around. This was, these were expensive spices. And we see a kind of uh, the expense in ointments that were used to, uh, you know, for the preparation uh, of bodies when we see the uh, Mary anointing Jesus' feet at Bethany in, in John uh, chapter 12. So Nicodemus has everything, and yet he still felt the need to seek Jesus. You know, we might have everything that the world has to offer, but there will always be something missing. Um, you know, when, uh, when, I was, when I was younger, you know, you, you felt like the, uh, the world is in front of you, the world is your oyster, but you always felt also that there was something more I couldn't quite understand, for want of a better word, the meaning of life. You know, what, what is the point of life? You know, it just se seemed to be, you know, this is going to sound ridiculous now, but I used to have a hamster called Harvey. And I used to watch that hamster on his wheel and think, that's what I feel like. He's just on that wheel. He's just like not getting anywhere. You can imagine how disappointed he is when he gets off the wheel and think, oh, I'm still in the same place. And, and, and that's what it felt like. You just felt like you were on this, this wheel that, that is called life and you weren't actually going anywhere. That There was something missing. Nicodemus had everything. And yet he comes to Jesus by night. Uh, and he says, we know that thou art come from God, for no man can do these miracles. You know, if, even if, uh, you know, somebody who's an atheist who absolutely 100% says, look, there is no God, there's no such thing as God, it can't be a God, it's impossible for there to be a God, even the atheist would have to admit that there was something different about Jesus. He was different from anybody that had ever walked the earth before or since. You know, not just in the miracles that he did, but in the way he spoke, in the way that he dealt with people, in the, in the miracles that he performed, the fact that he raised the dead, the fact that he made the blind to see, the fact that he made the, the dumb to speak. Uh, it's not just a, a record in the Bible that Christ died upon the cross and rose again. Even the secular historian Josephus records the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. There were over 500 witnesses to see Jesus alive after uh, after his crucifixion. Now, some people say, oh, yeah, well, Jesus just fainted upon the cross. And can I say this, that the resurrection would still have been a miracle because if he'd fainted on the cross after every single bone being out of joint and after the punishment that his body went through, to still be able to, uh, you know, to, to get up out of that grave and to move that stone, that's a feat in itself. 500 witnesses saw Christ after the resurrection. Even if people don't believe in God, they know there's something different about Jesus. And Nicodemus knew that Jesus was different. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
Nicodemus was the best kind of religious person they could possibly be. He was well educated. Uh, he was he had a, a, a fine culture. Um, he was born into a chosen nation, member of the Commonwealth of Israel, circumcised the eighth day, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee concerning zeal, one who paid tithes of mint and anise and cumin, touching the righteous which is in the law, blameless and willing indeed. He was willing to give uh, a Galilean, uh, a Galilean prophet, a fair hearing. Uh, the only man who could boast a record like that was Saul of Tarsus. Nicodemus outwardly was the perfect religious person. But there was still something missing in his life. No wonder the Lord Jesus Christ said to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, the first time we are born, we are born in sin. We're shaping in iniquity. L listen, nobody has to teach us to sin. Let me ask you this question. When our parents, you know, isn't it amazing when, when we're parents, we teach our, our children to speak. That's what we want them to do. With the, the two things we want them to do, we want them to speak and we want them to walk. And then it's not long before as parents we're saying to them, sit down and shut up. We want them to speak and walk, and then we want them to sit down and be quiet. Anyway, I don't know where that's coming from. Uh, but, you know, we want to get our children, we teach our children to talk, and we teach them uh, uh, to walk, and, and, and we try and teach them right and wrong, but we never have to teach them to sin. I never sat down, you know, with my girls and say, right, girls, this is how you come up with a real corker of a lie. You know, the, the next time you were in trouble, the next time you were having a, a row off mommy and daddy, you know, this is how you get out of it. These are the type of lies that you can use. You know, girls, this is, uh, this is quite an easy way to, to be disobedient to mommy and daddy. This is what you do. The next time we tell you to do something, this is what I want you to do. I want you to fold your arms and stamp your feet and go, no. We didn't, we didn't teach our children that. They just did it naturally. Not that they were awful, lying, stealing, disobedient children, but... You know, what are the point I'm trying to make is we don't have to teach people to do wrong. We do wrong naturally because that's the way we're born. We don't, uh, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. That's in our nature. That's the nature that we've inherited. And Christ's message to Nicodemus was he must be born again. Someone once asked, George Whitfield, why he always preached on that message, he must be born again. And do you know what he said? Because you must be born again. <laughs> Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And that Nicodemus is not understanding at the Lord's reply at all. But the interesting thing is, is Nicodemus didn't say, why? must a man be born again? Nicodemus said, how can a man be born again? And I think there is a softening in Nicodemus' heart. He's like, okay, I'm not quite understanding this, but I'm not asking why. I don't, I don't understand it, therefore I'm not going to believe it. I don't understand it, so tell me a bit more. How can a man be born again? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Christ is talking about the physical birth and the spiritual birth. He's telling us for a man uh, to go to heaven, he must have two birthdays. That's why we, we sing when we sing to people, happy birthday, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, uh, but one will not do, take Christ as your savior, and then you will have two. And uh, Nicodemus had to have a day when he was born into the kingdom of God. And it's amazing how Christ always used the physical to illustrate the spiritual. He used something people could understand so they could apply it to things that they couldn't understand. Physical birth provides life. A baby has life because they are born. Likewise, a spiritual birth produces a new life. Physical birth only happens once. Physically speaking, you can only be born one time. You can kind of see all the mothers going, Phew. and that's a blessing. Why any, girls, if it was up to men, 
if we were responsible for having children, there would only ever be one child per family. Because that is not something we would do twice. Even though I'm not saying we're not good with pain, you know, we are pre- probably a little bit more pain tolerant um, than women because, you know, we're built differently, built a little bit harder and tougher. But, uh, uh, you know, in, in regards to childbirth, you carry on. I'm very happy with unequal rights. You carry on with childbirth, ladies, that's fine. But physical birth only happens once. And spiritually speaking, that's the same thing. You can only be born again once. You can't be born again again, or even born again again again. You were just born again one time. Physical birth gives, uh, takes place um, because of the suffering of another. Um, I was present at both of our girls' births. It does look really tough. It, it looks quite difficult. It looked, it did look quite painful. Joe squeezed my hand at one time, and it was really a strong grip, and that hurt quite a lot. I've only brought it up a few years in our 13 years. In our 23 years, 13 years, our 23 years of marriage. Um, but physical birth um, takes place because of the suffering of a mother. The, a mother literally enters the very jaws of death to bring life into this world. And it's the same thing with the spiritual birth. Spiritual birth occurs because of the suffering of another. Christ died the most horrendous death upon the cross of Calvary so that we could be born again, so that we would have that opportunity to have that uh, new birth, that new life. Physical birth gives the infant a brand new start. No baby is born with a past. No baby is born with a past, only a future. And so it is with the new birth. The old life is passed away. It's almost as if you start with a clean slate. And all you have left is a, a, a new future in front of you. And that's why the physical birth is uh, similar to the spiritual birth. And I think that's why the Lord used the, the analogy to explain the point to Nicodemus. Uh, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Nicodemus obviously had experienced this physical birth which put him into the world, and now he needed to experience the spiritual birth to put him into the world to come. Um, in order to have that spiritual life, um, we must be born of the Spirit. Um, the Lord said, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be. Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? He doesn't quite understand what Jesus is saying. And oftentimes, you know, it's, it can be difficult to explain to people uh, what it means to be a Christian, what it's like to be a Christian, what you need to do to be a Christian. Uh, men without Christ often have a difficulty understanding spiritual truths. Ephesians says, um, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Some people are ignorant of God's righteousness uh, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. You know, there's uh, lots of people who think Christianity is just daft. You know, it's a waste of time. It's silly. You know, you're, you're wasting your time to do that. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Nicodemus was a leader in Israel, but he was ignorant of the truths that the Lord was trying to get across to him. Uh, a position in power doesn't necessarily mean that a person has wisdom or intelligence or spiritual discernment. This man has a knowledge of God, he has wealth, but yet he's living in spiritual poverty. And that was the tragedy. Nicodemus seemed to have everything going for him from a physical point of view, but spiritually he was bankrupt. And then we see the world's greatest truth. 
Verily, verily, I say unto you in verse 11, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. For the third time in this brief conversation, the Lord says, verily, verily. That word verily simply means truly. Um, it's almost as if the Lord is saying, listen, I need to get your attention. I need you to listen. Um, you know, when uh, I suppose different teachers, you may have had different ways of getting attention when we were in school. Um, for the, those who went to Brinkle and now, do you remember Ma Lewis? Do you remember Ma Lewis? Remember she used to throw the board rubber at people? And she was only a little old lady and she had a, she had a terrible, but that would get your attention. And he had physics with her for A-levels, and she was still throwing that board. I'm sure it was illegal, but anyway, I don't think she's with us anymore now. Um, so, uh, but it's a way of getting your attention to say, listen up. I can promise you this. For the rest of the physics lesson, you listened because you didn't want that board rubber coming in. Uh, there's lots of people going, oh, what's a board rubber? When we were in school, they used to use chalk on a blackboard, and then the board rubber actually wiped out the chalk um, we didn't have touch screens and iPads, teachers, and, and all of that. We had chalk, and are you with me now? No, still don't know what I want about. Okay, I'll show you a picture after for those who don't want to show it. But anyway, um, Marlewis would get your attention. And what would happen then is, is for the rest of the lesson, you'd listen. Because you didn't want that board rubber coming anywhere near you. And that verily, verily is like the Lord saying to Nicodemus, listen up. I need to get your attention. I need you to hear what I'm saying. Uh, you know, this is important. I need you to understand. How do you expect to understand spiritual things if you can't even grasp earthly things? Um, the Lord is basically giving Nicodemus the ABC of the gospel. Um, God hath revealed them unto us by, for his spirit, but for the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. The Lord is saying to Nicodemus, how can I get you to move on to the deeper things spiritually if you can't grasp the simple spiritual truths of just being born again? Um, in verse 13, he says, and no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And um, what the Lord is talking about here, um, when he says no man has ascended up to heaven and come back down, he's talking about the fact that he has ultimate authority to talk about heaven. Um, the Lord Jesus Christ, that was his abode before being incarnate in the flesh, before being born in Bethlehem, Christ was in heaven. We saw that in John chapter uh, 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, and then John later on go, goes on to say that the word was made flesh, and that word dwelt among us. Uh, but before that point, Christ was in heaven. So Christ had the full authority to talk about heavenly things. You know, there are, there are certain people that we turn to for certain help in certain areas. Um, Dad is not here this morning, but... I'm sure you won't mind you saying this. Uh, if you've got a problem with um, electrics or uh, anything kind of DIY, uh, Dad would not be the first person you'd turn to for help. Um, because um, not only is he not an expert in that area uh, of his life, he has no knowledge of it whatsoever. Um, and literally, he wouldn't have a clue. He's still trying to work out how the remote control works to turn on the TV. So you just wouldn't go to Dad for that kind of help. Now then... Um, when it comes to um, things like education and, you know, the education system uh, in school, he, that's his area of expertise. He um, lectures on, on how people can become exams officers and teaches them and uh, trains them, but that's his level of expertise. So if you want to know anything about exams and exams officers and, you know, stuff that goes on in school, great, speak to that. If you want to know anything about building or DIY, speak to somebody else. <laughs> Sorry, I'm. <laughs> speak to somebody who knows what they're talking about. You know, that, and, and that's the point. 
Christ is talking with a full level of authority. He knows what he's talking about. What he's saying to Nicodemus is, look, I can tell you all about heaven because that's where I've come from. Um, I have the full authority to tell you all about it. Um, Christ said uh, then to, to Nicodemus, as Moses was lifted up in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And the full truth of that statement probably didn't dawn upon Nicodemus until after uh, the uh, crucifixion, until Christ was nailed to the cross. Perhaps it was then that Nicodemus had all his doubts uh, flee. Perhaps it was then that Nicodemus finally was able to nail his flag to the mast, as it were. Perhaps it was then that Nicodemus finally said, my Lord and my God. Oftentimes, Scripture is difficult to understand until a particular event happens in our lives that causes us to rely upon that Scripture. You know, we may read of the fact that Christ will never leave us and never forsake us and, you know, not pay it two minutes of, of thought until we feel all alone and absolutely petrified. And we feel the Lord's comfort and then we think, oh yeah, the Bible says that Christ will never leave us and never forsake us. Perhaps it's not the, you know, we may read that, um, you know, to trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on thine own understanding in all thy ways he looked uh, uh, acknowledge him and he'll direct thy paths. We may read that scripture over and over again and, and pay it no thought whatsoever until we come to a fork in our spiritual journey with the Lord and there's a decision to make and either one of those directions could potentially be life-changing and then we come to rely upon the fact and recognize, all right, okay, that's what the Lord is talking about. You know, there were many times, even the disciples, when the Lord Jesus Christ said, destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise you back up again. And, and, and the scripture says the disciples didn't know what the Lord was talking about until after the resurrection. We might hear a passage of scripture over and over and over again, but not fully appreciate it or be able to apply it to our hearts and our lives until we go through that difficulty ourselves. We might know that the Lord is our shepherd, but not fully appreciate it till we need him to guide us. We might know that he'll be with us through the valley of the shadow of death, but not really fully recognize that until we go through that valley ourselves. Nicodemus probably did not understand the significance of the statement that the Lord was, was saying. But again, Jesus goes back to something that Nicodemus could understand. As Moses lift up the serpent in the wilderness, Nicodemus was a ruler uh, of the Pharisees, which meant he would have been well-versed in the law. He would have been well-versed in the Torah. He would have been well-versed in the, in, the, in the Pentateuch. He would have known those first five books off by heart. So he would have known what the Lord was talking about when he said that Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. He would have understood what had happened through Israel's disobedience to God and those fiery serpents uh, bringing the sting of death upon the people. And as Moses was commanded to build that, uh, that, that grace, the people then, as they looked towards that serpent, were saved from the very thing that was destroying them. And Nicodemus would have understood that. The parallel was obvious. Christ would be lifted up upon the cross. So every perishing sinner would be able to look to that cross and live. They would be able to look to that cross and have eternal life. In speaking to Nicodemus of these things and setting before him a graphic illustration, the Lord uses one of his emphatic musts. Ye must be born again. So must the Son of Man be lifted up. The must of the sinner is to be born again. The must of the Savior is to be lifted up as he heads to the cross of Calvary. And then finally, we come to the world's greatest text. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him 
should not perish but have everlasting life. No other single statement in the Bible so aptly sums up God's redemptive purpose in Christ for the human race. Who will ever know until the judgment seat of Christ how many millions have come to know him because of this one verse? The the words can actually be arranged in five pairs. You have, and if you you wanted to underline them or circle them or, or, or link them, you can. First of all, the first pair is God and the son the giver and the gift the author and the finisher of salvation two eternal two self-existing uncreated members of the godhead the giver and the gift then we have loved and gave and that's a twofold revelation of the benevolence of god love the prerequisite of such a gift um, the gift then is the proof of that love world and whosoever all people universally without distinction or exception and each person individually as if they were the only one in the world believeth and have the hand of faith stretched out in confidence to the giver and the hand of faith drawn back in contentment with the gift The trust and the transfer is complete. And then perish and life. The unutterable lostness of those who die without the Lord and uh, uh, those then, uh, the, the two extremes of those who trust Christ on that narrow road that leads to everlasting life. And this verse has been preached so many times and in so many ways. You know, you could just, you could do, Um, 10 messages just emphasizing one word in particular out of the whole text for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life god loved us It, it was god God who created everything from the beginning. You know, God who, when the uh, sin came into the world and sin separated God from man, it was God that already had that plan of redemption to reconcile man unto himself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Love is the motivating factor. Love causes us to do sometimes the craziest of things. When we truly love somebody, we would do anything for them. And that's what God did. God loved us so much that he was willing to go to the cross of Calvary for us. That was the extent of his love to us so that he could restore that relationship that had been lost. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish for everlasting life. Everybody There is not a single solitary person in the world today that God does not love. Have you ever met people that you thought, you were really hard to like? Have you ever met anybody in your life like that? Maybe it's a sibling. I don't know. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it was somebody in school. Maybe it's a work colleague. She just nodded in my direction really rude we made vows to love and cherish for better or for worse shame on you you know I said you if you love somebody you would do anything for them Hmm. (laughs) I don't even know where I was yeah have you had had somebody that you really struggled to like and you think Only a mother could love somebody like that. They're horrible. But God loved the world. No matter who they were, no matter what they did, God loves the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish and have everlasting life. That's the gift. God expects nothing in return. God doesn't want us to buy that gift. God doesn't want us to earn that gift. God doesn't want us to work for that gift. That gift was freely given. All that we have to do with that gift is receive it. 
That's all you do with any gift. I can't think in all the years, in all the birthdays, in all the Christmases that have ever gone past that I've ever turned around and said, oh, thank you, I don't want that gift. Even the socks that were bought Christmas time. You get more thankful for socks as you get older at Christmas time, but it's never been a gift that I've refused or turned down. I, I like gifts. I like gifts, just in case you're wondering. I like receiving gifts. God's given a free gift to the world, and all they have to do is, is receive it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The most valuable thing that God had, his son. That's what he gave. It wasn't a cheap gift. It wasn't an afterthought. It wasn't something that God just thought, mm, how am I going to deal with this sin problem? Oh, um, 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 you'll do. The Bible says that Christ was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Um, God knew, even before sin entered the world, that Christ would one day be given as a payment for sin. Christ was the most precious begotten Son of God. Christ wasn't an afterthought. This gift wasn't an afterthought. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever, whosoever, you see salvation isn't just for religious people. Salvation isn't only for churchy people. Salvation isn't only for, you know, the worst kind of people. Salvation is for everybody. Whosoever, there's not one single person left out, and there's not one single person that will be able to stand before the Lord and, and offer an excuse. It's for whosoever. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth. That's all we have to do is believe in the Lord. It's not just knowing of the Lord. It's trusting him. It's just putting our faith and trust in him. You know, we, we trust so many things in this world today. We believe so many things in this world today. You know, I'm amazed. And look, I'm not, a, I'm not anti... If, if people want to go out and... and, and you know, protest that the, the planet is dying, whatever, and, you know, whatever, whatever floats your boat. But I'm amazed at how, how, how much people are, like, jump into this, this girl from Sweden, Greta, is there, suddenly become, like, this massive celebrity, and it's like, oh, she's right. All she did was have a temper tantrum, basically. But, oh, you know, well, let's jump on the bandwagon and, and, and believe her. And, and, you know, good for her. She stood up, great, whatever. But it's just amazing what we believe as a society. And yet, when it comes to the things of God, oh, I can't believe that. You know, we were told that this planet would be destroyed by 2020. Still here. I, honestly, I'm a fan of global warming. The sunnier, the better. I like warm weather. I'm waiting for global warming to happen. You know, when, when the snow caused the global warming convention to be called off in April because it wasn't warm enough, they changed it then to climate change. But we'll believe scientists, oh, all right, the planet's ending. Yeah, let's, let's put taxes on our petrol and let's... I don't know why I'm saying that. All I'm saying is this, we believe. <laughs> and I'm not anti, I'm not anti you know, conspiracy theory or, you know, yes, and some, we've got a responsibility to look after our planet. Just getting myself into more trouble. But we believe so many different things in the world. And yet, when it comes to the simple truth of the scripture, maybe it's too easy to believe. Maybe it's too hard to believe. But all we have to do is believe in the Lord. Believe in the Lord and thou shalt be saved. That's what the scripture says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in the name should not perish. You know, to know that there is, there is something after this life should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the greatest text that we have in the scripture. That's how much God loved us. That he gave 
Christ to die for our sins. When D.L. Moody was in England at one of his crusades, he met a young man named Henry Morehouse. The Englishman was greatly drawn to the American, and the story goes that Henry Morehouse asked Mr. Moody if he would let him preach at his church if he were to come to Chicago. The evangelist agreed to the suggestion, lightly enough, never thinking he would have to make good on the promise. But in due time, Henry Morehouse arrived on Moody's doorstep to redeem the pledge. A reluctant Moody surrendered his pulpit, assuring his colleagues that the young man could not do much harm in one night and that he himself would follow him into the pulpit and rescue the situation. That night, Henry Morehouse took John 3.16 as his text and preached on the love of God with such passion and power that an awed Moody invited him to speak again the next night. This continued for a week. Each night, the young Englishman speaking from the same text. Moody was overwhelmed. In fact, Henry Morehouse became known as the man who moved the man who moved millions. On the last night of the series, Henry Morehouse said to the people, I have been trying to tell you how much God loves you. Suppose I could borrow Jacob's ladder. Suppose I could ascend that shining stairway until my feet stood on the sapphire pavements of the city of God. Suppose I could find Gabriel, the herald angel that stands in the presence of God. Suppose I could say, tell me, Gabriel, how much does God love the world? I know what he would say. He would say, Henry Morehouse, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's how much God loves the world. Can I say this this morning? God loves you. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you are facing. God loves you. God loves you enough for you to be saved. If you are saved, God loves you enough to keep you safe. If you are facing difficulty, God loves you enough to provide in your need. If you feel alone, God loves you enough to provide his presence in your life. If you are feeling weak, God loves you enough to give you the strength that you need. God loves you. And God proved that love. God commendeth his love towards us in that why we be yet sin as Christ died for us. We will never, on a human level, ever experience that type of love. I'm thankful for God's love. Because that love changed my life. Changed my eternal destiny. I wonder. I wonder if that love can do the same for you today. I, I know some of what some of you are facing this morning, but I don't know everybody's heart. I don't know where you are, either with the Lord or where you are in terms of what you face in life. But I want you to know this. God knows. God knows where you're facing. God knows the difficulty you have. God knows the, the struggles you are going through. God knows whether you will need saving. God knows whether you need comfort in. God knows whether you need strength, help, or whatever it is. Can I say this? Just ask him today. If you need to be saved, then ask him to save you. If you need to be strengthened, then ask him for his strength. If you need to be comforted, then just, can I say, crawl up into his lap and just find the strength you need today because God is waiting for us to respond to his invitation. Let's pray. Father, thank you again, Lord, for this time together this morning. We thank you, Lord, for all... Uh, that you've done for us, Lord, for the fact that Christ died upon the cross for us, for the fact that you're able to hear and answer our prayers. Father, we just pray that whatever uh, the need is here today, we just ask that that need would indeed be met. Father, I pray that you would meet with uh, those sat in this building this morning, Lord, and that you would help in, in whatever way is required. And Father, I just pray that we would indeed, as we leave this place, feel a, a sense of your peace and presence in our lives. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing our last hymn together. Uh, I know whom I have believed. And we stand as we sing. <laughs>
by the Holy Spirit our God. You are good and convinced of sin and of righteousness and of judgment that is to come. And that you will speak to us as individuals, our God. We commit ourselves into thy hand now. We pray for all those who sorrow. We pray for all those who are sick. And we pray that you will bring us back to the appointed time, maybe tonight, to hear thy word again. We ask it in the precious name. Thank you.